kid's corner, but I always learn something from that. Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 45, says this, And he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. You know, you can't really understand scriptures if God doesn't bless them to your spirit. Did you know that? Verse 46, he told them, This is what, would, what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. In the King James, it says, endued with power from on high. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, this morning, as we enter into this realm of your word, we pray that you will guide us through it and that you will bless, it, Lord, bless us with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So in this uh, portion of scripture, there's a four-part challenge. One is the substance of what they were to witness. These things, it says, you were witnesses of these things in verse 46. It's uh, the prophecy is about the suffering of the Messiah and the rising on the third day. They had indeed seen that. And they, um, they would see that and be witnesses of it. And they would know the truth of it. So he came in among them, showed them his scars, so there would be no doubt. Notice, if you will, that I'm alive, he said, in effect. Yeah, that really was me on the cross. Check out my scars. And the next part of that is repentance for forgiveness in verse 47. This is the substance of what they were to be witnesses of. Without repentance, there is no forgiveness. Salvation has to result in a changed life. Repentance means turning around. You come to Christ and you, and you get forgiveness for your sins and you become a changed person and you don't do those sins anymore. Now we all fail once in a while, but we turn around and go towards God when we were going the world's way. And it's not just about deciding from then, to, from then on you're going to be a nice person. There's a change. There's an actual change. You're born again. And the next part of what they were, the substance of what they were witnesses of is where it says beginning in Jerusalem. So they were to begin where his greatest resistance was the Pharisees could be in a rage against all of them. Jerusalem was the holy city, the seat in which uh, they put a temple for his name. And his presence was there in a special way. But Jerusalem was also connected to Rome. They used to say all the roads lead to Rome. So because of this connection, the, um, the witnessing would have a direct um, uh, we have a direct route to Rome and, there, and then from Rome to the rest of the world. And then, and then the second part of this is the appointment as witnesses. In verse 48, you are witnesses. In other words, what you have seen and what you will hear and see about me. A witness sees things but you're a witness when you tell about those things. When you verify, yes, that's true. That happened. That's when you become a witness. And the promise in, in this uh, scripture was the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And in, in, the, in the book of Joel, in chapter 2, in uh, verse 28, 29, it says, And afterward I will pour out my Spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, 
Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Everything changed after Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. The disciples had been a sort of a motley crew, just a gathering together of fishermen and tax collectors and all kinds of people from all kinds of places and mostly focused on their own uh, their own life, their own problems. But now they would begin to be ready to build a church. They didn't even know what a church was, but they would be prepared to stay uh, uh, to, they were told to stay and wait for this upgrade of the Holy Spirit, which they didn't know what that even would look like. But they were ordered to do that and to then carry the gospel. Wait until prepared. They weren't prepared to fight spiritual battles. They didn't even know what spiritual battles were. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, they had a tremendous change. They were born again. They were believers. They had faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. They had accepted Him. He was their Messiah and they knew it. But they didn't have the power to go forth and preach it and present it to a hostile world. They didn't have that power yet. But as you know in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, the Holy Spirit came and rested upon each one of them. And there was a change that took place. Peter, he was the guy that denied Jesus before he was crucified. Three times. And now, this change that came over him because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, he went out and preached a sermon to the people in the streets, the people they were afraid of. And the whole sermon is recorded in the book of Acts. Even he used scriptures. He was all of a sudden a different person. He was a different, he had a different challenge in his life to present the gospel. And 3,000 people, as you know, got saved and were cut to the heart. They said, what should we do? And he said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you for the mission of your sins. And 3,000 people repented and were baptized. And that was the beginning of the church. So how is our challenge today like their challenge was? Well, the social climate. You know, people think they know what's best for their own life. They, they, they think... And, people, and the idea is that people have keep changing. But what God presents does not change. It's unchanging. What pleases Him is not changing. What, what people think they should do, they please themselves, and they think they know what's best. But what God says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And what is required in response to that is our submission to God in, in humility and honoring His sovereignty. In our, in, our, in our culture today, just as it was back then, people are living in darkness. Evil is darkness. New kinds of evil are coming up all the time. We're living in evil times. You know, when they're, when they're teaching, encouraging little kids in the schools to examine their feelings to decide whether they're boys or girls, it's evil. And it's all over the place. Sweden had the good sense, and they're a very progressive liberal country, but they have had the good sense to outlaw the treatments that they're still doing in this country. I think there are three or four states that outlawed that too, where they're starting to give little kids eight years old hooping and blockers to keep them from becoming what God intended them to be. This is evil. 
it's ungodly, it's hideous. But there's so many people that that's just fine. Evil is darkness, and the people around us are living in darkness. John 3, 19 and 21, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Talking about light. Jesus is our light in John 1. Four and five. In him was life. You know, this begins by in the beginning was the word, the word was with God. And down to verse four it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. But darkness reigns in people and in darkness reigns in attitudes. And it rains in Marxism. It rains in, in this gender dysphoria business. It rains in social acceptance of things that the Bible declares to be evil. Abortion. Gay marriage, stuff like that. It's darkness and it's evil. And it's getting worse. Colossians chapter 1, 12 and 14. And giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. That's where we are. The kingdom of light and darkness and things that are done in the darkness. Those things should offend you. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. They don't believe in sin. But we are in the light. Here in darkness that they don't know. Opposition. You know, people oppose the gospel because Satan has blinded them. And the gospel confronts their sin. People, there are people that consider the Bible hate speech. But if their idea isn't what God's idea is, then they're wrong. Yeah. Wrong. We're in the light and in the right because it's God's right. It's not what society decides to do. But this, this conflict has always been with us. I think it's getting more powerful. The longer you live in the land, the more you see it rear its. And a lot of that stuff was like in the closet. Now it's right out there in your face. If you don't agree with them, then you're a bad person. But they are wrong because they're opposed to God. Two biggest evils officially recognized homosexuality and abortion. The next one coming is euthanasia. Human euthanasia became legal in the Netherlands in 2018. Belgium, Colombia, Luxembourg, Canada, and India assisted suicide. It's legal in Switzerland, Germany, South Korea, Japan, and in the U.S., Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Hawaii, Vermont, Montana, Washington, D.C., and California. Did you know that? Does it make you tired? It makes me tired. And the gender business. People are being persecuted for using what they think of as incorrect pronouns. The guy thinks he's a woman, he changes his name, 
and you don't refer to him as her, you just keep going to him, then you're a bad person. Are you kidding? I'm not doing that. I refuse to call Bruce Jenner Caitlin. I refuse to do that. He's a him. He was made a him, and he's a him. I don't care what he says. There's no clinical test for that. It's an idea. It's an attitude. It's a feeling. God wants everyone to be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is His desire. That was His desire back then, and it's His desire now. Most of our society is rising up against the authority of God as revealed in his holy scriptures. And there are some of us who are holding the line. <laughs> we're holding the line. Only those who have been redeemed can testify of the experience. You can't testify that you know all about somebody's experience or somebody's life unless you have lived that, that particular life. I can't, I can't stand up here and say I know all about how to cut up a beef or a hog. But Clyde can tell you all about how to do that because that was his life. You know, I can't, I can't tell you how to, how to operate heavy equipment. But that was, that was Clyde's life. You can operate all, every, anything. It was his life. I can't stand up here and tell you how to do that. I don't know anything about it. But if you're redeemed, then you can be the witness. Only those who have been redeemed can testify of the experience. You are the light of the world, Matthew chapter 5. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven so what is letting your light shine look like what do we start out saying it's about being a witness people see a difference in you and wonder how you got that way what is it about you that you don't get mad, that you don't use swear words, that you don't get wrong. What is it about? How come you're so peaceful? How come you're happy? How come you do things? And there's your opening to be the witness that God wants you to be. We also need to be prepared, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And that was what happened in Acts chapter 2. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That power, that endured from on high came when the Holy Spirit came and it never stopped. There's never been a time when people didn't get filled with the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Did you know the shakers were tongue talkers? Did you know that? And if you ever you can read a description of their services, they were they were wacky. We should be a little more wacky. They were dancing in the spirit and, and prophesying and, and singing in tongues. And reporters called it bedlam. And a lot of Pentecostal churches used to be more bedlamish. I wish we were. <laughs> but we are where we are. But that power comes from God. And the purpose of it is to be a witness. Why do you need that power to be a witness? Because there's a natural reluctance to speak about God to people. There's a natural fear, and it's because there's an enemy that wants to put a stop to you doing that. And the boldness overcome that comes from the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Consider Philip in Acts chapter 8. The Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road. He's down from Jerusalem. She starts out 
on his way. The uh, Ethiopian eunuch was there. He was an official from, uh, from Ethiopia in charge of all the treasury of Candace. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. He's on his way home. He's sitting in, the, in his uh, in chariot reading uh, from Isaiah. And so Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up into his chariot and sit with him. And this was the passage that he was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And so the eunuch said to Philip, he said, tell me, who was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that passage of scripture, which I'm, I believe is in Isaiah 53. And as they traveled along, he explained about all that. And then he got to where he's explaining the good news about Jesus. And they came to some water. And he says, look, here's water. Who could stand away from my being baptized? So Philip won this man away from sin. He won him. He won him. Because he had the boldness. He was directed by the Holy Spirit. He had the boldness to do that. When they came up on the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. A change took place in him. Because Philip full of the Holy Spirit had the boldness to do that. What were Philip's qualifications? He had knowledge about the Word of God. He knew the Word. We need to know the Word. He had boldness. That came from the Holy Spirit. He had compassion. He didn't want to see this man perish in his sins. We should have that compassion. He had humility. He just did what God told him to do. Go on that road. So he did it. He had obedience. He had sensitivity to the guidance of God's Holy Spirit. And he had enthusiasm. Do we have all those things? Maybe we don't have them all at the same time. <laughs> but those are things we should seek to have and to do. And some of us, you know, some of us need to wait. We don't like waiting. I was preaching about that on Sunday night. We don't like to wait for anything. We don't like waiting in line at the doctor's office to be called in. We don't like waiting for spring when it's wintertime. We don't like on a hot days like this waiting for fall. We don't like to wait. Waiting for the first ripe tomatoes in the garden. Waiting for the fish to bite. I like to go to buffet style restaurants because I don't like to wait. Am I impatient? Well, right then I am. <laughs> How many know you're more impatient for food when you're hungry? <laughs> of course, I'm impatient for dessert even after I'm <laughs> In Acts chapter 1, 4, and 5, on one occasion, while he's eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Here's the waiting. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days he would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They were to wait for something that they had no knowledge of. They knew something was coming. They didn't know what it was. But they waited for it. They were obedient. Waiting for God to do something. That should be exciting because you know he's going to do it. <clears throat> In Psalm 27, 13 and 14, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And that says, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Waiting is recommended. Do we like it? Well, if you think about what you're waiting for, it could be more pleasurable. If we're waiting for God, we know that well, if we get what we're waiting for, it's going to be so awesome. That's a little different than waiting for the direction.
restaurant. The world is on a co collision course with God. In Noah's day, it says the whole earth was filled with violence. In Abraham's day, God called to Abraham to bring you out of a culture of idolatry, including his own family. He says, get out of the land where you are and go to a place I will show you. God called Moses from the fire of a burning bush to bring Israel out of captivity. Destruction awaited the Egyptians. The destruction of all the first one, both animals and people, except for those on whose door was the sign of the blood of the Lamb. Destruction. Israel was on a collision course with God because of idolatry after, the, after it was established as a nation. And they were destroyed by the Assyrian Empire and later by the Babylonian Empire. And what they were doing? They were sacrificing their infant children, burning them alive in the fire to the gods of the people around them. Baal, Chemosh, and Molech. What kind of a coincidence is it that those people, those cultures, and those three, what they call gods, all had the same kind of worship? I think that was a demon with three different names. That's what I think. And Satan was behind that. Just like he's behind the worship. The sacrifice unborn children on the altar of convenience or one thing or another. They, God in his mercy brought the Israelites back to Jerusalem after 70 years. You can read about it in the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. So evil abounds in the world today. We can all agree to that. But way back in Timothy chapter 3, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Are we in the last days? Probably. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Look around. Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. People are flaunting themselves against God. We see it all around us. We see it every day. How far away can destruction be? How far away from the appearance of Jesus? He's coming back. But we need to get some more people ready to see him. We're going to see him. We need to take as many people as possible with us. What would you risk? Or what would you give up to save a soul? What would you give up? If in giving that thing up, you would know that a person would escape the flames of hell. That's real. That's real. That's why we give money to missionaries. Because they're out there in the front lines doing that work. What would you give up? What would you do to prepare yourself to be a soul winner? Do you have a prayer life? Those are questions you need to answer for yourself. Do you have a scripture life? Do you take the word into yourself every day? Do you have a power of the Holy Spirit in you? Do you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And the evidence is, is speaking to other tongues. Is God first in your life? It's a big one. Are you prepared to be a soul winner? 
the only preparation they had before Acts chapter 2 and verse 4 was their closeness to the Lord and their obedience in waiting for what was promised. So they could witness the things they had seen. And they had now the baptism of the Holy Spirit so they could be bold in their witnessing. Tremendous change took place in that. And if you don't have that, you should seek to have. Because the only reason we're alive on the planet after we get saved is so we can spread the gospel. Otherwise, as soon as we get saved, we get raptured off the planet. As soon as we get saved, he would take us home. Now he wants us here so we can bring the rest of the world as, many, as much of it as we can. And that's why there's a church. The church has, has purposes. One of them is to get together and worship him, corporate worship as well. And the other is that we support each other. Because we all have trials, we all have difficulties. And it's through the church that the power of the, the power of the gospel takes place. It's, it's through the it's through the preaching of the word and the teaching of the word that, that people become um, come from a place where they don't know what they should do as a believer to an emboldening, an emboldening and and become witnesses and share in their faith. Um, that's what it's all about. The church is a place of preparation and a place of worship. And a place to, to, to disseminate the, the gospel. That's what we're for. And usually someone that's not a believer isn't going to come here. Because it's sort of threatening to them. You know, sort of So guess what? We have to go to them. We have to go to our neighborhoods, our workplaces, the people we know. And we have to go to them. When they see the difference in your life, and say, even if they don't say it out loud, they say, you why? You know, why that person is like that? And the only difference between them is that they actually are believers. Someday you might get to explain Bring one into the kingdom. Then bring them to church. I had a pastor used to say, get them saved, then bring them, because they're not going to come. You know, they, it's not going to come. It's a, it's, the church is off putting They don't know what to expect. Uh, those people might think I'm bad. <laughs> I'm think smart. You are bad, and so am I. All have sinned. We're all sinners. There used to be a thing where people were pretty all, all these stuff, all messed up, and that kind of stuff. Who cares? <laughs> right? Who cares? Somebody came a few weeks ago. We didn't know what kind of, you know, if you dress up, I said, we don't care what you have on. It doesn't matter. I don't think Jesus had many changes to clothes. He didn't know what to call Sunday best. He had what he had. So all the, all the apostles and disciples, of which we are some. Amen. Amen. Well, I've rambled on long enough. Would you stand? Dear, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to get together to share the word, to lift our, lift our voices together, to, to magnify you, Lord, and to bless you.